uh, based on this uh, simulation model. We're then going to take those uh, parameters and use the same parameters on a, a kind of small scale uh, proof of concept, if you will, uh, as an ecological investigation. So this is quite a, when I say small, it still took a very long time to analyze. But uh, so this is it's kind of the last stage is more of a proof of concept. So this is, this is what um, uh, a snap looks like in terms of the pressure. Uh, it's got a number of interesting factors. The first one is uh, when, the, when the claw snaps shut, this is at this point here. Uh, and this kind of slow variation is basically the bubble kind of expanding and cr contracting a little bit. And then at this point here, this is at the point where the bubble collapses in on itself and produces this uh, extremely loud uh, impulse there. So this is from three different species and kind of the size of the bubble is dependent on the size of the claw, is the kind of general idea. Interestingly, it always produces positive pressure, which is quite useful in our hydrophone detection. If it, if it reflects <coughs> from the sea surface, you get an inversion in that pressure, so you can easily tell the difference between reflections and, and the direct sound, so that was quite useful. Um, the other one, like I said, shrimp snaps are consistently loud at about 185 decibels, which I know sounds exceptionally loud to us uh, or above water dwelling uh, acousticians, um, but things are different underwater basically. Um, so it's got a, a remarkably low standard deviation, so, and this is over uh, multiple species this was calculated, so Kian did a lot of this investigation. So we got hold of about 92 examples of snaps to build our model with, and the next thing we started thinking about was uh, snap uh, the shrimp behavior so how often the question is how often and what's is there some sort of process that can model how shrimp snap in time um, and a guy called Matthew Legg did, uh, did a, a, a great PhD on sh uh, snapping shrimp noise from the point of view of detecting signals within a snapping shrimp noise and he showed that we can uh, get a pretty good model by modeling shrimp snaps as a point process in time in particular a point process in time that's um, that's uh, governed by a, um, a modified Poisson process, is that, if anybody's coming. So what I'm talking about in terms of a Poisson dis uh, process is we're modeling this into snap time. So basically uh, a Poisson process has a probability density function that looks like this, which is basically a, a decaying exponential. So all that's saying is that it's less likely there's going to be a long delay than a short delay, is what we're talking about. Uh, so he suggested we could use a modified Poisson process so I'm not going to go into the, into the details of this because this made my brain hurt at the time for many weeks. So, um, uh, so what he suggested was that we've got the snapping rate. So this is a probably probability distribution of a, uh, of a snap occurring at some point in time. And this parameter lambda, lambda is the snapping rate essentially. And what he suggested is that the parameter lambda is not constant. It actually changes with time uh, according to some other random unknown distribution is what he suggested. So he suggested that we use this Cox Ingersoll Ross, which I've never heard of, something to do with uh, financial markets modeling of the statistical process. He suggested that we use this, which models how the snapping rate itself changes with time. Um, so this is, this is what I've done. So the, so the way that this works is each individual uh, shrimp that I kind of randomly distribute on my seabed is controlled by a, a single uh, Poisson process. And, that, um, and, and they're all independent, they're all different processes. And that, so the snapping rate for each of them is then controlled by the same um, uh, overall snapping rate. So there's a global snapping rate which is changing with time. So all of the shrimp are kind of speeding up their snapping and slowing it down roughly at the same time is the idea. The reason why I did that is, is because then it kind of matched with the model that this Matthew uh, Legg used. So it matched well with that. Because he modeled all shrimp as, uh, like a population of shrimp as a single Poisson process rather than what I'm doing, so. So the problem was I needed to know roughly how often the shrimp snaps, okay? So I needed uh, an estimate for this parameter down here, this lambda m, which is the average snapping rate to kind of uh, to, to model this stuff. Um, so luckily, uh, Chiara pointed me in the direction of this paper, which was very good. So um, these guys had been measuring the abundance of uh, shrimp by basically getting uh, isolation booths and putting them over uh, sponges where these shrimp live. 
counting the number of snaps and then cruelly digging up the sponges and counting the number of shrimp. So um, from that they can work out how many shrimp are in there, how often they snapped and it gave us this uh, average snapping rate for a single shrimp. This, this turns out to be once every 40 minutes, which is surprisingly not very often, but there's a lot of them. So. <coughs> So that it also gave us a ballpark figure in terms of uh, um, how many shrimp to put in my model, um, which was useful. The next thing I was thinking about uh, was the uh, simulating the noise in the ocean. So, um, and this was quite good because there's been an awful lot of uh, work in terms of coming up with models for uh, underwater noise because of communications and trying to uh, make communications robust to these kind of noise. But the main source of noise underwater, aside from individual boats, comes from physical processes on the surface. So we're talking about uh, the wind disturbing the water, producing waves, and basically bubbles are formed and those bubbles release uh, kind of um, uh, the noise that we're talking about. So the main processes we're thinking about are from wind and from rain. Uh, and some, there were some well-defined models that I could use for this. Other sources include uh, turbulence and thermal noise, and I also uh, I found a model for distant shipping as well. I'm not going to go into the details because I, I don't have the time for this, but basically each of these processes, um, the model is essentially a power spectral density. And from this power spectral density, I design a, a filter and then stick some noise through it, be it white noise or in other, t other processes from the wind. I was using a different kind of noise that has a controlled ketosis. So it's a bit peakier, basically which is a bit more realistic. I thought that was important uh, because of course I'm going to be detecting peaks in my signal. Um, so that's basically these uh, kind of noises. They're parameterized by a uh, level of shipping, which is just a number between zero and one. Wind speed in meters per second and rainfall intensity. So I can adjust these parameters and create noises for different conditions. That's the idea. The next thing I needed was um, a model of individual boats, as this is probably going to be the main source of error. Uh, so Kian managed to find three 60 second examples of boat noise from the actual recordings from the location where there wasn't a lot of shrimp activity and then manually went through and removed the, any shrimp uh, snaps that you could find, which was a very painful process. Um, so we then researched the typical levels of these kind of boats and we found them uh, the source levels at about a meter to be between 150 and 165 decibels, less than shrimp snaps, uh, which is surprising. Um, and what we did was we took the loudest point in each recording and basically said, well, that's where it's closest to the array and we're gonna normalize it to that point there um, and basically make that uh, point there uh, equivalent to uh, the level of whatever distance we want it to be. So we can kind of, we've got a, a model here where we can scale the audio to simulate a boat passing at different distances, is the idea. I just thought I'd play an example of what this simulation produces, because, and it is, this is very realistic actually, having heard some kind of uh, other ones. It's not very loud because the sound isn't working properly in here, but have a, have a listen. So it just kind of sounds like static. So that's the sound of a healthy area. So that's kind of millions of shrimp, basically. And it's actually, uh, having heard some other examples, it's pretty realistic in terms of what it sounds like. Oh. There you go, enjoy. So, so now onto the next step. So that's the simulator. There's some more details if you if you want to talk about those afterwards that's that's fine i can talk about the actual noise generation process if you want um uh, but now on to the detection and localization so there's a few stages to this we appear to be starting at stage two um <laughs> and there, there was a slide here earlier <laughs> it's gone so so the first step ignoring what that says there uh, the first step is to uh, essentially uh, locate all of the peaks in every single hydrophone, okay? So we're doing a, a peak detection exercise where there's a few rules where we're basically trying to identify peaks that are uh, no closer together than about 20 microseconds. So I'm trying to ignore clutter on the, on the seabed, so if you get any extra reflections there. 
that are positive pressure because if uh, a snap gets reflected from the, uh, the surface then it inverts the, the pressure so you can identify reflections that way. Um, so in, in every single hydrophone signal, and there's four hydrophones, we're identifying each of the individual peaks. So that's uh, step one. It did say when I loaded up this, there was some sort of error. Would you like to fix it? It's clearly yes was the wrong thing to press. <laughs> <laughs> so the next step is, okay, so you've identified all of these peaks. The other rule, sorry, was this uh, threshold in level, which is, um, uh, which I forgot to mention. So basically I'm saying the, the, the peak level needs to be uh, above a certain level, depending on, so I've defined a, um, an area on the seabed that's about 100 meters radius. Mm -hmm. So this is my measurement area. And what I'm saying is, okay, what's the maximum level of a, a shrimp snap is 186. That's gonna propagate from the seabed. What's the furthest distance? It turns out that propagation loss turns out to be about 40 decibels. So I've got an idea for what the level of the shrimp should be at the hydrophone array. And then I've got this, um, uh, I know by how much the level of the shrimp will vary because of the standard deviation. And I have this other parameter, which basically tells me how many standard deviations below this level I want to go. If that makes sense. So I've got this tunable parameter that I can kind of pick up more and more snaps by making this bigger and bigger and bigger, but more and more noise. So sorry, that was, that was all in, in this slide here. So excellent. Um, so the next task is once we've identified all of these impulses is to try and identify the same snap in each hydrophone. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to, um, once we've identified the same snap in each hydrophone, we can then compute the uh, time difference of arrival between all of the hydrophones and that'll give us an idea of uh, what this wave looks like and the direction more importantly, so we can localize the direction. So the next step is try to identify the same snap in each hydrophone, which is not that easy because this is kind of just a single impulse and there's other impulses, there's other noises. So this is, this is what uh, the algorithm turned into. So, so here's the four hydrophone signals with an impulse uh, in each one. Uh, the first thing I do is select a particular, hydroph a particular hydrophone signal as my reference. So let's say hydrophone one here is going to be my reference. I then compute a cross correlation between each of these. Uh, so cross correlation between hydrophone one and two, and then one and three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The idea being locate the peak in the cross correlation function. That'll tell me where the uh, uh, relative time of arrival is. So it'll tell me what the relative time difference between that and that is. To try and improve matters a little bit, I uh, windowed my reference signal to get rid of any sounds occurring before my snap. So I've located the snap in this reference signal here, remove all sounds before and remove all sounds afterwards, just to improve my uh, reference snap, which is my, uh, my first one up there. So I'm using an algorithm, if anybody's come across this before, as the, uh, called the uh, generalized cross correlation with phase transform or more catchy name GCC fat. <laughs> so, so this is basically it's just performing a cross correlation but it's performing a cross correlation in the frequency domain which is up here and the phase uh, the phase transform stuff essentially what we're doing is we're whitening the signal so we're taking the, uh, um, the magnitude of both of these uh, signals and normalizing it. So essentially this is all going to be one and the only thing that's changing within this stuff is going to be the phase itself, hence the, the phase transform thing. Um, so we're whitening our signal. So whitening the signal in this, in this respect helps because if you have a, something that's broader in terms of frequency when you do your inverse Fourier transform, which is what you're doing here to compute your uh, correlation function, if something's broader in frequency, you end up with something that's narrow in time. So you get a better estimate for whereabouts that snap occurred. That's the idea. Um, so what we're doing is we compute this uh, correlation, cross-correlation function, find the maximum value and the argument, uh, in other words, the time where that uh, uh, maximum occurs, that's going to be our relative uh, uh, time difference of arrival between the two sensors. So this is relative time difference of uh, arrival, delta t, between sensor I and sensor J. That's what, what I represent. Um, so we kind of arbitrarily chose hydrophone one as our reference signal. Basically to get our snap reference, we just used, uh, well I say us, I guess it was me. I feel we're in this together now. Uh, so 
we chose uh, Hydrophone 1 to be our reference and then uh, kind of, uh, you know, got a set of four times. One of them hopefully will be zero or else things have gone very wrong. Um, but I could have chosen Hydrophone 2 to be my reference. In fact, there's an advantage with doing that because sometimes you may get noise randomly occurring on your reference snap. So in Hydrophone 1, there may have been some noise and perhaps your reference snap would have been cleaner in Hydrophone 2. So, so using that kind of idea, I've repeated this four times using every single hydrophone as a reference um, and came up with a, an empirical algorithm that I just felt the need to not only name, but also draw a pointlessly complicated diagram to describe something quite simple. Okay. So the Snap and 82000 sounds a bit outdated nowadays, right? Uh, so this is what it's doing. So at the start, you initialize uh, uh, with a hydrophone one as your signal, every single snap that you've detected, you're adding to your running total. You just initialize with that. Then select the next hydrophone as a reference, so hydrophone two, and iterate through all of the, uh, the snaps, which is what this is doing. And the idea is that it um, uh, goes through every single snap, it asks this question, is the snap already in the running list from H1? Uh, if it is, then update the snap list entry and iterate the counter. So now you're saying I've got two examples where I've located this snap. If it's not, then you add this to your snap list and, and initialize a new counter. So the idea is that you do this for all of your hydrophones as references, and then you've got kind of four possible estimates. So what I've been doing to try and identify which are the same snaps using uh, the different references is I'm just <coughs> looking at one of the, the time of arrival in one of the hydrophones. <coughs> um, now what I can do is I can, it, you know, if I've got more than one counter for a particular snap, that's actually a pretty good estimate because I've got two cases where you, you, you know, you've identified the same snap. So that's actually a pretty good estimate. Uh, so this, is, this increases the robustness quite nicely. So, what time I on? Uh, 30 again. So the next step was to perform the localization. So all I've been doing is identifying the snaps, computing the time of arrival. I now need to do the mathematics to kind of see where this wavefront is coming from. So the uh, process of doing this is I'm trying to estimate a particular vector, so a unit vector which is pointing in the direction of propagation, so U here. Um, you can think of this problem in terms of uh, two sensors at a, at a time. You can't quite see at the bottom. So I've got a uh, sensor I and sensor J uh, down there. And if you compute the path, the vector describing the path between those two, um, that's just this here. So that's the vector describing the path between those two sensors. Um, and then we can compute the dot product between this uh, vector and our unit vector, which is describing the path of propagation. Uh, and that relates those two vectors to the angle between them, this cos, the, uh, cos phi there. The next step is to think about the geometry of this thing. So we're assuming this is going to be plane wave propagation, which is a realistic thing to say because this is suspended about 60 meters above the seabed. So it's pretty plane wave we're talking about here. Um, so we can just use trigonometry to uh, relate um, uh, basically the difference between a wave front arriving at sensor I and the delay or the path difference it would take to get to sensor the other sensor there uh, using trigonometric uh, trigonometri function there uh, and then just relate it uh, using the dot product that we uh, looked at previously so so the dot product just expands to this and we can just formulate this as a, a matrix equation here um, and then basically invert this matrix and solve for u, which is what we're doing. So we're basically trying to find this uh, vector, which is our unit vector, pointing in the direction of propagation here. Once we have this, we just invert u, so it's pointing uh, towards the source instead. Um, and the idea is, if, if the source is orig uh, originating, originating from above, then it's probably not a shrimp. You know, it, it, it'll be a boat or something. So we can use that fact. Um, so then we extend that vector down to the seabed and we can localize it onto our uh, model of the, sea, uh, the seabed down there. So this is what uh, was missing in my slide earlier, which is, this is my measurement area. So I've defined a 100 meter radius 
and I'm not worrying about any snaps that occur outside of this. So this is kind of probably rejecting quite a lot of snaps because in my model I defined, if you remember, a two kilometer radius, a two, two kilometer area rather. The reason why I'm doing that is because obviously as the snaps go further and further away, the, the level goes down, falls into the noise floor. So it's good. So it's kind of, there's an advantage to keeping the area small. So I can kill, still estimate the population density just within this area. So I'm basically trying to make it robust to noise. Um, we then got to an interesting problem that me and Kian, Kian were scratching our heads over for quite a while, which was why are there um, so many shrimp uh, coming from directly below the array, um, which look like an echo <laughs> from a previous sound that came from directly above the array, basically. Um, and it turns out that in, in uh, we'll see some evidence of this later on, but it turns out that these things are rocking about in the water and if the, the waves are particularly high, because they're moored with a, 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 a steel, uh, steel rope, whatever you call it, uh, steel cable, there you go. And that's rocking about and banging around and producing these um, vibrations which actually travel through not the water, but the, uh, the structure as well instead. Um, and we were looking at this going, this makes no sense, I don't understand. And then we kind of computed what the speed of sound would be of that and found it was significantly higher. Um, so what we thought of, thought of doing um, is basically to try and estimate what the speed of sound is relative to our um, uh, model. We assumed a particular speed of sound of water, and if it's much higher, then clearly it's not, it's not traveled through the water. I won't go into the details of how we actually did it, because I think I'm, I'll run out of time if I do. Uh, but yeah, so we get a relative estimate of speed of sound. How much does it deviate from what we might expect it to be in water? Um, and that lets us kind of uh, throw away the results which are clearly not actual shrimp, something that didn't travel through water. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's the algorithm. Uh, in these next few slides, I'm going to talk about what um, uh, examples I simulated. So I'm going to simulate a bunch of different examples um, and then analyze them uh, to understand how well this uh, detector is working. So these are simulation parameters. So uh, shipping wind speed, rainfall intensity, individual boat passing distance. Um, so I basically uh, specified two levels for shipping, low and high. Wind speed, three levels. Uh, rainfall intensity, again three levels. I was trying to capture low, medium and high of all of these things. And then individual passing boat distance, so no boats. Very close, 50 meters, 101 kilometer. Uh, so I i generated examples using kind of full factorial of all of this stuff uh, and perhaps I shouldn't have because it took a week <laughs> so, so it took a very long time to compute for each of those I'm computing um, I think it was eight different yeah eight different uh, shrimp densities going from very low density defined by this all work uh, suggesting what a degraded area looked like to a very uh, healthy extremely healthy density uh, eight levels which is what you heard you heard one of the higher ones and once I computed this I then attempted to detect all of those snaps knowing where every single location of the, of the shrimp was <coughs> um, so this is this is what was also missing from my earlier slide so this is my threshold so I've got uh, the threshold I'm using is going to be the peak level of a snap which is about 185 uh, minus the losses from the furthest propagation distance and then, and then again, minus what the variation in snap level might be, multiplied by some tunable parameter n. So you can change how sensitive it is by increasing that. The larger that number, the more sensitive. It's nth. So the number of standard de deviations below the threshold, I kind of just vary between 0 and 6 in 0 0.5, uh, uh, it's not dB, but 0 0.5 uh, factor steps. And then it's also interesting to try a pre-filtering because a lot of the um, background noise is dominated by low frequencies so perhaps a uh, high pass filter would help so um, we tried a cutoff frequency a high pass filter with a cutoff frequency so not having one and then increasing it to see, just to see if that would help so took a very long time so lots of cups of coffee and tea later in fact, I went on holiday, <laughs> came back, and it's still going. Well, went on holiday, came back, and realized I put in the wrong parameter. I had to recompute the whole thing. You Stand. went back on holiday after that? <laughs> yeah, I should, I should have done. Yeah. Okay, so, yay, it finished, finally. Um, 
so now I need to kind of measure the performance. So I've got some estimated snaps. I've got some estimated snap times when they occur. I also have some estimated snap uh, sources, where they, you know, what their sources were on this virtual plane. So to try and measure the performance, um, I use a few kind of uh, parameters that we're using in sort of uh, classification. So the true positive rate, so that's the number of um, correctly identified shrimps that, that were within that 100 meter radius circle. It's true positive rate. False positive rate, so that's false alarms. That's when you're saying there's a shrimp there and there isn't. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, and then you can combine this, uh, these two using this Matthews correlation coefficient, which is basically a balanced measure of performance. So it kind of takes into account if there's differences in the, in, in the size of your, your, your uh, number of snaps and number of non-snaps. So it balances the two, it's the Matthews correlation coefficient. So after all of that, these are the results. <laughs> so, it seems like a bit of a, uh, yeah, a letdown, but it was, it was good. So what we found was that best performance was achieved when there was actually quite a high um, uh, threshold, but low threshold rather, sorry. So uh, NTH was 5.5. Filtering did help, which is kind of unsurprising. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. So what I also did was I plotted uh, the performance. So we've got the Matthews correlation coefficient, so that's the balanced measure. We've got the true positives, higher is better. False positives, uh, higher is worse. So you want this to be low, false positives in yellow. Uh, and what I did was I gradually increased that threshold where I say, this doesn't look like something that came through uh, the water, this looks like it was structure born. Gradually increased that and kind of calculated what the performance was. Unsurprisingly, it, it increases, but it's interesting to see that kind of around 20 or 30, there's a sudden knee where it starts working. And then maybe once you get to about 300, there's not much point. It kind of works, uh, you know, fairly, fairly well after that. It doesn't really improve very much. So from that, what I took was there's not much point in allowing anything through above 300 meters per second. I didn't want to make it any lower because I'm not modeling, modeling everything that happens in, in, in the water because you've got currents. Currents are very low, but you, you know, you can get uh, slight shifts due to the blowing the snap either way. So I, I figured 300 was a good, a good uh, kind of benchmark to pick there. Um, I then did a bit of, did, did some stats. So one thing about this is I think uh, this session here in particular is I do want people's opinions on what I'm doing. I'm kind of looking at Bruno over here. So, so I do want your, your opinions on what we're doing on this stuff because um, uh, I haven't traditionally done an awful lot of stats analysis, but um, it, it has been quite fun. So I thought it'd be interesting to understand what the impact and performance was of all of these different factors. So you've got shipping level, which had two levels, wind speed, which had three levels, rainfall, which was three, boat, which had four levels, and shrimp density, which had eight different levels. So I was interested to know, uh, does uh, wind have an impact on the performance of my algorithm? Um, so my starting point was to try and do an ANOVA um, to basically compute the mean level of these of the Matthews correlation coefficients or the true positive level, see if there's any differences, differences between them. But what I found is that they were exceptionally non-normally distributed. So that meant that we couldn't use an ANOVA. And the sort of uh, the standard alternative um, I found was this uh, Kruskal Wallace H test. Um, when you want to do, uh, you know, detect the differences between groups. So what this asks is rather than if there's a difference between means, it says, is there a, it, are these two groups differently distributed? So it, it does, it's basically uh, a one-way ANOVA on ranked levels instead. So you don't have the requirement that it needs to be normally distributed. So looking at this, um, these are the p-values. So these tell me whether or not a particular factor is significant. Uh, so I highlighted in red the ones that are, and basically wind speed was not, um, uh, did not seem to impact the uh, performance at all, perhaps surprisingly. Rainfall also didn't. Um, boat proximity did, shrimp density did. Um, so that's interesting, but you can't really get anything more from this analysis. This is just a broad brush. There's something going on here. Uh, so I decided to plot these means and just to see what was going on. So this is the relationship between the uh, shrimp population density increasing down here uh, and the true positive rate 
and the false positive rate. So it's kind of interesting. So you can see that it kind of gradually decreases. So the, the, the number of correctly identified shrimp decreases kind of gradually, not sharply, gradually as you increase, the, increase this uh, uh, population density. So it's missing some of the shrimp, but maybe not that many, surprisingly. But what's really obvious is that at some point, so when you've got quite a large population of shrimp, as you gradually increase it, at some point you start getting a huge number of false positives. It's kind of interesting. Um, so I kind of thought about this, uh, and I think basically it's due to, we're looking at this 100 meter radius area, and you've got all of these shrimp that are outside of that area, which will be kind of creating correlations between any particular shrimp you've kind of identified. Um, so basically they're the, uh, the shrimp from outside of the area being wrongly kind of brought inside that 100 meter, 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 uh, meter radius area. That's what I think there. Next interesting thing to look at, was relationship between how close the boat gets and the performance. So this is kind of interesting as well. So we can see that the true positive rate, so correctly locating and identifying shrimp, doesn't massively change as you kind of get the boats get closer and closer. It does a little bit, but that's kind of not, not very much at all. What's really noticeable is the number of false positives. That does kind of make logical sense. If you've got a lot of you know, broadband, possibly impulsive noise, going on from a boat that comes very close, then you're gonna get an awful lot of false positives where these, the correlation is just matching with random bits and pieces. Um, so from this, what I can see is the algorithm does not give me a very good uh, answer when boats get very close. So I need to take care of this. I need to make sure that I effectively know when the boats get really close and at that point, don't trust the data. So that was my kind of thinking here. Um, and I took something from uh, environmental acoustics, which is the L90, so level exceeded for 90% of the time. So this is a measure that we use an awful lot for quantifying what the background noise of something is, L90 measure. Um, and what I've done here is I've uh, collected together uh, what the L90 measures of all of these different examples, individual uh, kind of examples, are, and computed the Matthews correlation coefficient. And what you can see is, is as you increase the background noise level, perhaps unexpectedly, the performance goes down. And basically, this is due to kind of the boats passing by. But what I can do here is I can see that there's a, a kind of threshold around 99 decibels or thereabouts um, where the performance doesn't really change very much going down like this. So there's a kind of uh, threshold point here that I could choose where I can say, if the L19 measure exceeds 99 decibels, don't trust this. So this is, this is what I've been doing. So I'm basically not going to trust any data that uh, has an L90 above 99 decibels. <coughs> so that's broadly speaking <coughs> uh, the results I've got from my simulated data. So the next step was to actually take some real recordings because these, these hydrophone arrays have been up and recording, I think it's since 2014, possibly earlier. I don't know if, don't know if you know. One year, I think the project was running for one year. Okay. I'm not sure exactly when it started. Yeah, so they've got quite a lot of data. Uh, they had some issues where, um, so they're recording constantly and these things are transmitting wirelessly back to shore. Um, for whatever reason, they had dropouts every sort of three hours. So we don't have kind of a consistent recording over 24 hours. Um, but just to kind of a uh, proof of concept, this is what I'm kind of uh, talking about here. We just thought we'd do a little investigation uh, to try and, uh, the factors that we're interested in were, you know, does the boat activity have an impact on shrimp activity? And does the conditions have an impact on shrimp activity? So there's a pinch of salt, salt to be taken with these because we're basically comparing one day with another day in terms of, uh, we've chosen days that were within the same season, but there could be other things going on. So hence, we're not really presenting this as being uh, ecological results. We're just saying, look what you could do. Okay, so we've picked uh, four days uh, and we've got those recordings of four days at both locations. So we can analyze this at both locations. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare this day with this day. On this day, there was very calm conditions, the water was very flat. On this day, there was exceptionally rough conditions. In fact, we had to reject a lot of the data because of that, but there was rough conditions here as well. And then we had another two days where this is kind of at the beginning of the tourist season where it was very quiet and then a bit later on, when there was a lot more boats going on. So that's the caveat, there's actually 
that there's actually quite a, a large difference in time between those two. Okay, so I analyzed all of that data, um, detected all my shrimp, uh, the location, uh, etc. Um, and then I was interested in uh, how am I going to analyze this stuff. So um, what I chose to use is a generalized uh, linear model. So uh, a generalized linear model, you can kind of think of it as an extension to linear regression or an ANOVA. It's kind of like the next uh, level up, so to speak. So the limitation with a uh, linear regression or uh, an ANOVA is once again, you assume normality. You assume that your data is normally distributed. Um, and by definition, my data is not normally distribution, di distributed, it is, it is count data, which normally has this kind of exponential or Poisson distribution. So I couldn't use an ANOVA. I needed to use, um, you can call it a count regression model. So this is kind of standard for, for, for uh, analyzing count data. You could use this generalized linear model to do this. So this is the way I've coded my data. I've got a dependent variable. So I've taken all of my data and split it up into 60 seconds and counted the number of shrimp that snapped within that 60 seconds. This is my kind of uh, dependent variable. Uh, snapping rate, number of snaps per minute, essentially. Uh, so the factors, so I'm going to look at all of these factors to see if they have an impact on my dependent variable. They are location, so I'm comparing the two different boys. Time of day, now we ended up because of all I said before about the data dropouts and the noise, on all of those days we only ended up with having eight hours where we had the same time on, on all days. So basically we're just comparing 3 a.m., 5 a.m., etc. We're just comparing some times in the mornings um, a, uh, and then a couple of hours in the evening. Um, and then boat activity, quiet or noisy. And these are all coded as uh, categorical uh, random factors. So I haven't chose to code this as ordinal. As you can see, it's not, well, it kind of does go in order, but there's lots of bits missing. So I, I thought just code it as a categorical uh, random factor instead. Um, so the first kind of choice, if you're doing this kind of model, will probably always be to use a Poisson regression. It's the simplest one to, to use if anybody's done has anybody done count regression analysis before? Kind of. Kind of. Okay. All right. So, uh, so I didn't put my hand up then either. If you may have noticed, but, uh, yes, I haven't. <laughs> so, um, so I, I know you have. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. Not with this complicated yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the the starting point would be Poisson because this is the simplest one. But Poisson is very very restrictive because you make an, you make an assumption you make an assumption that the mean is the same as the variance. This is the definition of a Poisson distribution, which is exceptionally restrictive. And if they differ, that means you have something called uh, uh, what's it called over dispersion. Um, and hey presto, I had over dispersion. So Poisson basically, I had to reject this kind of model. I couldn't use it. So the choices I had uh, were to use uh, a negative binomial. Uh, it's basically using a different probability density function uh, where you can separate the mean from the variance. So you can you allow the, to have a different mean and a different variance. And the other option is to use these kind of what are called zero inflated models. And basically what this means is that it says you've got two coupled models going on. One of them is a Poisson distribution and the other one is just a logistic regression that's saying this zero could have come from my Poisson distribution or some unknown other process. It's just it's doing. So you've got these zero inflated models that basically you can use to account for excess zeros or excess number of minutes where there's been no snaps. So to do this, I basically just compared all of these. Uh, I computed this KK information criterion, which is a measure of goodness of fit. Uh, and basically lowest is better and for both cases, so I'm comparing calm with rough separately to quiet versus noisy, for both models uh, it tells me that this zero inflated negative binomial fits the best. Okay, so, but this is just a relative goodness of fit between all the models. So what I needed to do next is to see if they, because you can kind of see, look comparing these two, I actually don't know if you can compare across here, but uh, comparing these two, that's a seriously higher number <laughs> than this one. So perhaps this calm versus rough didn't fit as well. Um, 
So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to compare my raw mean snap counts. So I'm just computing how many counts I got in every minute for every factor combination. And I'm going to compare it with the output from this model. So this kind of process that you do is a, um, what's it called? Called a residual analysis, basically. So what have we got here? So these bars are my model. This is the number of snaps in a minute. I then computed the 95% confidence limits using a bootstrap method. And these dots are just the mean values of the same data. So I'm basically saying, how well does my model, does my model agree with my actual you know, raw mean values? Uh, and I think the answer from this is no. Okay, <laughs> very much not. So this is my calm versus rough condition. Uh, and you can kind of see that there's rather large deviation in quite a number of cases. Um, so uh, from this, basically, it doesn't work, it doesn't fit. But there's a very good reason for that. We'll get to it uh, shortly, just at the end. But I'll just show you the um, quiet versus noisy. Because this one, aside from sort of one uh, oddball one up here, kind of looks like it fits an awful lot better. So the, the expected values from my model are agreeing much nicer, a playing ball much nicer with my uh, actual mean, uh, mean, uh, mean values. So this means perhaps I can use this analysis to kind of ask some interesting questions about the data. Um, so I guess just looking at the data, it's quite interesting. So this is uh, one location, Carrega, that's uh, location one and that's location two. So the first thing that you can see is there's an awful lot more snaps occurring, occurring at, at this boy than at this boy. So that's one interesting thing. So this is uh, the results of the statistical analysis. Um, so what we're doing here is we're comparing contrasting factor levels. So I've got my quiet versus loud uh, level. Uh, and what I'm doing is I'm contrasting noisy with the quiet case in the background. And here I'm contrasting Carrega with the, with the other location. And all of the hourly locations are being contrasted with 3 a.m. So I can look at this and I've highlighted in red the ones that are significant. So we've got significant effect of quiet versus loud, significant effect of um, location. So what's interesting is this, this estimate represents the log count change. Uh, that's going on when you go from a quiet environment to a noisy environment. So this is the log count change. So the log, basically if you undo the log, essentially take the natural exponential, that'll tell you what the factor change is. So I can't do uh, uh, natural exponentials in my head, so I've written it down. Um, <laughs> so that first one there, if you take the uh, exponential to 0.25, what you get is uh, 1.3. So that tells me that the snapping rate increased by a factor of 1.3 in a noisy environment compared to a quiet environment. That's quite a nice thing to say if this model is working correctly. Location, I've got a uh, log count of no change of 0.99. If you take the exponential of that, it's uh, 2.7 thereabouts. Um, I should know that one actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there, so basically that means that the uh, snapping rate at Carrega increased by a factor of 2.7 compared to the, the other location. So I will, I will, the time thing, basically there's a lot more activity late at night, basically significant, four or five times uh, more activity at, at 11, uh, 10 and 11 compared to 3 a.m. It's interesting. Okay, so that's interesting, but why did my other one not work? So what I've done here is I've, um, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it here first. Uh, <laughs> So what I've done here is I've, I've uh, collected together bins. I think they're five meter bins. I forget. I think they're five meter bins and counted the number of snaps uh, and uh, computed the number of snaps per minute in every single bin going on here. So looking up here, there's quite a nice spread distribution. There's an awful lot going on, more going on in here than in, in here. So this is the calm versus rough criteria. So that's nicely spread. It seems relatively nicely spread there. But hey, look at what's going on here. Any, any suggestions as for what this is? So this is the amount of snaps that have been localized to any particular area on the seabed. But we seem to have some sort of geometric cross pattern going on here. Mm, I wonder what that could be. Uh, 
So basically, this is the, the noises of more structure bone vibrations that I haven't managed to eliminate. So all of this stuff is just the boy rattling around in the water. Okay? For whatever reason, this doesn't seem to work very well at, at, the, uh, at this location. It's in Darko compared to Correga. So that's basically why my model didn't fit, because there's something else going on which I didn't account for, which is how much it's wob wobbling about in the wind. It's quite interesting is to look at the, um, my snap map for my quiet versus noisy. Um, so we've only really just started looking at these, so I haven't really made any firm conclusions about this. But seems relatively well distributed up here and up here with maybe a, quite a few more of those particular points here. I thought this was quite interesting because there seems to be some sort of structure there which is also repeated here. So I was thinking maybe it would be interesting to actually look at the topological map of that area to see if there's something there that means that the shrimp aren't there. And if there is, then we can use that as a, a, an even stronger sort of case that this is working well. So that's that's next step, I think. Look at the topological <laughs> map of that. I literally just thought of that. But there you go. <laughs> uh, that's how well prepared I am. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, conclusions. So what have we done? We've I demonstrated this snap detection algorithm where where we've tested it using a simulated um, virtual shrimp map. Um, showed some proof of concept results. But in truth, we can't really say that um, uh, shrimp snap more in a, um, uh, in a in a quiet environment than a noisy environment, um, all the way around, sorry, in a noisy environment than a quiet environment, because we've only compared two days. It needs to be more longitudinal study, uh, a lot more days, and of course those two days were at you know over a month apart. So perhaps there's some other factor going on, temperature. There was a difference of, uh, I don't know, about over two degrees or something, I think. Uh, so there could be something else going on. So if we're going to use this for ecological investigation, then we need to do this further. But um, uh, at this stage, I'm yeah, quite happy with just the proof of concept thing going on. So thanks. <laughs> so any questions or thoughts or whatever? Um, the, the 1DB. Sorry, the one micro Pascal DB reference, is that a standard yeah. hydrophones? Yeah, underwater measurements right, right. generally have this kind of yeah, difference. Yeah. And the other thing I thought was if it's a collapsing bubble, how can that create a positive pressure? Pass. Anybody know? <laughs> <laughs> I know they produce like a jet stream. They do, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Can't answer that, I'm sorry. Magic. Just a couple of thoughts come to mind. Uh, uh, the first one being, I think if you presented that hydrophone data or array data to certain people, they would start talk talking about using inverse methods and least mean squares rather than doing every reference possible and seeing what they could find out from that. So yeah. I if you've got Phil Nelson doing that with microphone arrays, he would be getting out kind of inverse methods and regularizing matrices and doing that. Yeah. And that might be a more robust way of, of, yeah. of getting yeah. all the mi microphones and right, also all the hydrophones mm. involved. Hi, I think we bought this room too. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay. We're going to make it snappy then. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So if anybody has any further comments, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, around, so it'll be good to hear what